The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome everyone to another Directions Magazine webinar. Today our sponsor is Penn State and the focus is going the distance, pursuing a graduate degree online. This is part two on this subject. Part one took place last May 26th and you can find that webinar in our archive. In our archive. We'll also include a link to it in our follow-up note to attendees. My name is Nora Parker and I'll be your host today. As you can see, we have a very distinguished panel today, and we'll introduce you to everyone in just a minute. You can check out our current offering of webinars on our homepage under the Webinars tab. Next week, we have a webinar sponsored by Oracle that focuses on retail analytics in an enterprise cloud. The following week, Pitney Bowes Business Insights sponsors a webinar on the topic of international geocoding with a case study from Willis Ree. Tomorrow we'll be opening registration for a webinar that's coming up sponsored by Alteryx with a case study from Del Taco. And by the way, if you are going for your GISP, most of our webinars can be applied to the EDU3 Educational Chief Achievement Points Schedule, so if you want more information about that, please drop me an email. We very much appreciate your time today, and we're going to honor our commitment to you by finishing within the hour. So let's get started. So, next slide, um, we have, you can see that we have a large global audience with more than 270 people registered for this webinar. And as you can see, we have people from every corner of the globe represented. Let me talk to you a little bit about housekeeping. We encourage you to ask questions. In your control panel, there is a section called questions. Click on the plus sign and type in your question. You may do this at any time during the webinar and we'll respond to as many questions as we can during the Q&A session toward the end of the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties, you can use that same interface that you use to ask questions to send us a message. You can also send us a tweet at DirectionsMag and please include those hashtags there. I'll be keep keeping an eye on that. During today's webinar, we'll ask you to participate in several polls. We appreciate your response as it is important to understand the interests of our audience. And the number one question we get during webinars is whether the webinar will be available to view later. Yes, this webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive an email with instructions on how to access it on demand. We'll get that email out to you as quickly as possible, hopefully tomorrow, barring unforeseen circumstances. Finally, you will have the opportunity to participate in a brief survey as you leave the webinar. We appreciate your participation in that. So now, just a quick introduction to Directions Media in case you're not familiar with the full scope of what we do. We're best known for our comprehensive website, Directions Magazine, and for our daily newsletter. Our channels are new. These are our resources with news, articles, videos, and podcasts for professionals professionals in state and local government, remote sensing, location intelligence, and location-based services, and many more. They're a helpful way to navigate our copious content to drill into your specific area of interest, and you'll find them on our homepage, directionsmag.com. We also have several blogs, the All Points blog being probably the best known one. And of course we have our webinar series. We're currently running three or four webinars a month on many different topics. We're also active in conferences. We're currently working on the Rocket City Geospatial and Alabama GIS conference, which will take place in November. And we're also working on a conference next spring on the topic of location intelligence. That one will be co-located with the Oracle Spatial User Conference. Now let me introduce our um, Penn State Webinar Series moderator, Wes Stroh. Wes is a lead author and instructor of a new course just launched this fall, Location Intelligence for Business. Prior to getting involved in GIS and geography, Wes worked in technical sales and marketing at AT&T and Exo Communications and product management with May Department Stores Coach and Eddie Bauer. His research interests include marketing and business strategy applications of GIS. He holds an MS in geography from Penn State, a BA in history from Arizona State University, and a certificate in network design and analysis from the University of Denver. So Wes, let me hand it over to you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nora, and I'm excited to be back again for the sixth in our series, Inside Geospatial Education and Research. Uh, we've really been enjoying hosting this series and working with everyone at Directions Media. Before we get into today's content, uh, as always, I like to start off with a little poll. And poll number one is going to ask our audience, what do you hope to gain by furthering your education? 
So Nora, if you'll go ahead and turn on the poll, I'll run through the options folks have to choose. Um, perhaps you're new to geospatial, checking it out as a potential career. Uh, perhaps you're hoping to expand on your bachelor's degree. Uh, maybe you're looking for skills to make the transition to the next level. Uh, maybe you're mid-career and wondering if you're optimally positioned. Or something else that we haven't listed there. So go ahead and just take a few seconds to answer the question. I'll keep an eye on got about half of the audience in, so we'll give you folks another moment here. And uh, so far, the bulk of you are, are thinking skills to make the transition to the next level. Of course, today's topic is going to be appropriate for anyone in any of these categories. Okay, we've hit 80%. Nora, let's go ahead and close the polls and let everyone take a look at the results. Not entirely surprised to see that. It looks like 40% of folks are looking uh, for skills to make the transition to the next level. Uh, about a quarter of the audience is looking to expand on a bachelor's degree. 18% mid-career wondering if um, optimally positioned. 14% some other category. And then 3% are new to geospatial. Well, as I alluded, go ahead and close that, Nora, and head back to the deck. Um, we do have something, I think, for everybody today. Um, we take a look at our agenda. Uh, I want to thank Nora for welcoming us. Um, we have a couple of panels today. And in between the panels, uh, we're going to be uh, receiving some presentations from the three panelists. And the panels are going to cover questions and, and, and typical FAQs on everything relating to graduate education in terms of GIS and geospatial technologies. So uh, we are going to talk a little bit about certificate education, professional certificates, post-baccalaureate certificates. We're also going to talk about master's level work. So I think we've got something for everybody today. The first panel we're calling the who, what, why, and how of online education. For those of you that might be uh, interested in graduate education but not sure about doing it in an online environment. And all of the folks representing the various schools today actually come from online education programs. So that's what we're going to talk about. Introducing the programs represented on the webinar, we have Dr. Patricia Drews from Northwest Missouri State, Steve Hick from University of Denver, and my boss, Dr. Anthony Robinson from Penn State. And then following their presentations, we're going to have a second panel, just the facts about our programs and a little bit more about the details. Finally, we're going to open up for some Q&A. So let's go ahead and move on. As we took a look at the uh, registration questions that some of you submitted, uh, pretty typical and, and not so different from the last in our series, um, some of you are wondering where you can do the program from. Do you have to be in the U.S.? Can you be somewhere else? How many credit hours can be transferred into a program? Are there brick and mortar meetings? Do I need to come to campus? How much time and cost are involved? Well, we're going to try to address all of these today. Again, I'd like to uh, welcome our panel. I mentioned their names, and we've got headshots of all of them now. Uh, Patricia Drews is the GI Science Graduate Program Director from Northwest Missouri State. Stephen Hick is the GIS director and a lecturer in the Department of Geography at the University of Denver, and Dr. Anthony Robinson, lead faculty member of online GIS programs at Penn State. And the first question we've got for the panel is uh, to kind of characterize what kind of students, who are they in online education? And I'm going to turn to Anthony first. Anthony, who are our students? Thanks, Wes. Um, so our students are typically at working professional adults. Uh, most of them are looking into continuing education to help pivot uh, in their career in some way, or in some cases they're looking to start uh, their education about geospatial uh, things, all things geospatial, to begin a geospatial career. So we sort of have two different kind of audiences. Um, our students overall typically have a bachelor's degree in hand already, and our programs are designed around that requirement. Thanks. Patty, same question for you. Who are the students at Northwest Missouri State? Uh, thanks, Wes. Uh, our students really fit that same description. Really, most of them are working professionals. Uh, some of them have a little bit of GIS uh, experience, but they want to continue their education to move to another level. And we do have some students that come to us with really no background in GIS, but they're looking uh, at e either the certificate or the degree to help them make a career change. Thank you. Um, I, I guess it logically follows that we should ask uh, perhaps what and why are they studying, and, and Patty and, and uh, Anthony have both alluded to this, but uh, Steve, what and why are they studying? And maybe you can distinguish between certificate level work and master's level work for us. 
Okay, thanks, Wes. Um, yes, uh, students that uh, are starting on a certificate, as we've heard before, probably already have their bachelor's degree in hand, and they're just looking for more skills-oriented learning, uh, just specific tools or techniques that they need to apply to their work environment. And then those that are going on for a master's degree uh, may have more management aspirations or uh, more anal analysis or analytical uh, ideas in mind to apply it in their workplace. Thanks, Steve. Patty, same question. In terms of Northwest Missouri State, what and why are they studying with you? Uh, well, Steve described uh, that really well. Um, uh, like uh, uh, his students, many that come to the certificate program are really interested in taking just a few classes so they can increase their skill level or perhaps in some cases enter the, uh, the GIS um, field. And those who want to go on for the master's degree uh, some of them also are uh, coming into the um, our, our program because their employer is getting into uh, to GIS, and so they want to be part of that new effort in, uh, with their uh, employer. And actually, that applies to the the certificate students as, as well. That some of them are first introduced to GIS through the fact that their employer is. Um, uh, becoming more integrating the technology more into their their own workplace. Thanks, um, Anthony. I, I know we didn't prepare this, but uh, uh, did you have anything you wanted to add to that, or should I move on to the next one? I, I would just add that uh, I guess at Penn State, uh, the distinction between the certificate and the MJS uh, program for us is that for the master's level, we're really focused on preparing uh, leadership uh, folks to to enter into leadership roles in the geospatial community. So we're, we're targeting people with professional experience uh, who are ready to make the next step in their careers already. Okay, thanks. Um, I know that one of the questions that we've gotten in previous uh, um, webinars we've done, certainly on the, on the uh, first edition of the Going the Distance, is kind of a concern about how one does online learning. I, I think folks can intuitively uh, kind of picture what goes on in the classroom, but can't necessarily do that in terms of, of online learning. So Steve, I'd like to turn to you and ask, how does the online um, learning experience happen? And, and please address things like the web-based interfaces, uh, types of communications, and maybe access to software and tools, seeing that we are such a, uh, a software and, and tool intensive um, field. Okay, uh, I always wondered this myself, how we were going to teach GIS online back when we got started. But first of all, the learning environment and the learning management systems have evolved tremendously. And at the University of Denver, we use two course management tools. One is called eCollege, and the other is called Blackboard. And there are others out there, but these are browser-based systems that allow people to get online and access all of the materials that they need for, for a course. And then when they do get into these, they'll find their course materials, and those may be presented as uh, slides or audio presentations, video presentations. And again, in our case, it varies by the class and the instructor. But also embedded within those learning management systems are a built-in email system and discussion forums. So it's not uncommon to have weekly discussions. So that same kind of chit-chat that would go in, on in the classroom takes place online via discussion boards. And then some instructors will, have the, will make the opportunity available to chat in real time. And it's always important with online learning to make the distinction between synchronous and asynchronous delivery. So in some courses, delivery may be synchronous in that it's uh, delivered everybody's online at the same time, but in our program we do everything in an asynchronous format so students who have jobs and families and whatnot can get online when they need to. With regard to the specific GIS software, uh, all of us here today have got an ESRI site license which then enables us to make ArcGIS, uh, ArcInfo software available to everybody. So what we do is at the beginning of a, the, each academic quarter, we mail a copy, uh, a DVD, to every student that they can then install on their own computer. And then uh, many of us also have the ability for students to log into remote servers and use a virtual environment and get the same desktop uh, experience in, online that they get in the classroom. Thanks, Steve. Anthony, anything to add to that? 
I'll just add very briefly that uh, here at Penn State we benefit a great deal from having a team of instructional designers who come from uh, education and instruction backgrounds who have graduate degrees in those fields and they work with uh, our faculty who are GIS experts to develop uh, exciting new course content using much the same uh, platforms that Steve just described. So that's the, otherwise we're very similar. Uh, the software question we get asked quite a bit and um, in addition to the Esri stuff, all of us offer uh, other student licenses for all the other kind of remote sensing packages that you might use uh, and other types of tools. Uh, fortunately, vendors like to give us things for free because they know we're teaching you. Thanks, Anthony. And, and certainly if, that's, uh, if any of those uh, technicality questions are pert uh, pertaining to your individual interests, uh, feel free to jot a note in the Q&A section and we'll try to address more specifics when we get there. We're going to go ahead and, and turn to our second poll now. And uh, poll number two uh, reads, which of the following would you consider obstacles to furthering your education? And, and we're specifically thinking furthering your education online. And you can click all that apply. Um, Nora, go ahead and turn the poll on if you don't mind. We're used to seeing um, these types of concerns from potential students. Um, but the ones we have listed here, uh, reputation of online education, the cost of online education, or the cost of education in general, available course options, quality of instruction, and studying at a distance. So we're always eager to find out what things we can improve or what questions we can answer for folks who are interested in our programs. Um, we've got about 55% in. I'll give you a few more seconds so that we can get a nice spread of the data here. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm not at all surprised to see cost. 79% uh, uh, of you are suggesting that cost is, is the number one concern. Um, Nora, why don't we go ahead and show the poll results? I think we're at about cap right there. And again, no surprise, so it, it hit up to 80%. Uh, and uh, certainly, especially in the current economy, we're thinking about cost. One thing I can say is that we've done a couple of webinars talking about how GIS and geospatial is a growing field. So the good news is there seem to be jobs in our field at the other end of the education uh, proposition. Um, some of you are concerned with reputation, also quality of instruction. And we're certainly going to talk a little bit more about that when the three faculty members of uh, program managers do their presentations. Also, the availability of course options. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in, the, um, in another poll at the end of the um, webinar. And then studying at a distance. And, and so if you've got more specific questions on any of those, go ahead and, and uh, jot those down to Nora. And we'll try to address some of those as we move through the webinar today. Um, and Nora, if you can go ahead and turn the poll off and give me the deck back. Um, I would like to just do a quick hand raise because cost is, as I anticipated, the number one concern. So first of all, um, will your employer, employer pay for your continuing education? So just raise your hand if you know for a fact that your employer will pay for all or part of your continuing education. And I'm not seeing the hand raise results. There. Yeah, that's OK. Um, I've got them here, Wes. Um, they are flying in. We've got 25% uh, of the audience so far that, uh, that, the audi that their employer will pay for it. And people okay. are still um, responding um, uh, pretty frequently to that. So looks like um, they're starting to slow down a little bit. We've got, we've got about 30% of the audience, Wes. Okay, thanks, Nora. Mm -hmm. um, not exactly surprised, and, and the one thing I'll say about that, we, we will talk a little bit about cost as we work through the webinar today. Um, most of us are, well, all of us are faculty in the program, and, and as folks indicated in the opening FAQ, we're, we're experts in GIS and geospatial, not in financing education. But uh, if you have a question about that, we know who to point you to in our respective institutions. So. Please don't let cost be a barrier. Um, we, we certainly um, have ways of, of managing that. But check with your employer. So all right, let's go ahead and move on. Um, I'm pleased to introduce the first of our panelists who's going to, uh, or introduce more fully, the first of our panelists who's going to um, present a little bit about uh, her program. Patricia Drews is an associate professor of geography at Northwest Missouri State University. She has more than 20 years of experience in the GIS field in industry and education. 
Uh, she teaches GIS classes at both the undergrad and graduate levels. And she also serves as the Graduate Program Director for the Online Master of Science and Graduate Certificate Programs in GI Science at Northwest Missouri State. Patty, welcome. Thanks very much, Wes. Um, Northwest Missouri State University is a regional state university located in, in Maryville, Missouri with about 7,200 students. Uh, our online Master of Science in uh, GI Science and our graduate certificate program began in the fall of uh, uh, 2003. And this fall we have uh, 100 students enrolled in both of those programs combined. The curriculum for our Master of Science degree program consists of 10 or to 11 courses plus a, plus a thesis. We allow students without uh, GIS background to enter directly into our, our Master of Science program. Um, and for those students, we um, have a, a prerequisite course that they take to basically bring them up to speed in the basics of, of GIS so that they're able to take the other courses in the program. Uh, we have a, a test out exam for that so that those who have significant background can simply test out of that prerequisite course. We allow 9 to 12 semester hours of applicable credit to, to transfer. Um, the credit cannot have been used to uh, for another master's degree, uh, and that's pretty typical amongst most, most universities. Our, our, our students do do a, a thesis for our program. The, we encourage students, if it is possible for them, to make the thesis applicable to their employment. Uh, the, the picture here on the slide is of, of Sherry Massey actually doing a, her online thesis defense. She is the GIS coordinator for Dickinson County, Kansas, and for her thesis project, she um, identified preferred locations for a new fire station uh, to best serve unmet demand. And that original request came from the county emergency manager. So she was able to take something that she needed to do for her job and work that into her, her thesis topic. We also have a, a graduate, online graduate certificate program, and their students take four or five courses, uh, a subset of the courses required for the master's degree. Um, all the courses taken for the certificate count towards the master's degree. So we have quite a few students who actually are unsure about online learning, uh, but they might want to try a course, and they're unsure about whether they want to go on for the master's degree. So we encourage them to do the certificate first, and then many of them have decided to continue on for the master's degree. Time to completion. Um, we allow our students to choose the number of courses that they wish to take each, each term based on their individual uh, availability of, of time. And so most of them will take one or two courses, fall and spring, and perhaps a summer course. And at that rate, uh, it will take three to four years to finish the master's degree, and one to, to two years for the certificate. Most of the students finish the certificate in a year or so. The next slide shows the tuition uh, for our online programs. And uh, working that out, the master's degree for Missouri residents costs about $13,000 at current tuition rates. Non-Missouri residents, $21,000. The certificate, about $6,000 for Missouri residents and 9,000 for non-Missouri residents. I'd like to spotlight just two, two students in the program. Um, Melanie Riley uh, finished her master's degree about a year ago. She was the GIS specialist for the Iowa Office of the State Archaeologist. Her thesis project was to use GIS and LIDAR to identify potential burial mounds in the state of Iowa. And then based on that, uh, those potential sites, that would allow archaeological crews to go out in, in, in person and basically to narrow down the, the, the area where they would want to search for additional sites that would need protection. That picture there is, is of Melanie actually in an archaeological dig. Uh, the second student that I would like to spotlight is uh, Stephen Sanford. He's a good example of a student who um, did not have really any GIS background coming into the program. Um, and as he first earned the certificate and then moved into the master's program and now has, 
um, is finishing up his, his thesis, um, he has moved from progressively uh, to progressively more and more responsible uh, GIS positions, starting out as an intern, then employed as a GIS technician, and now he's currently a geospatial analyst with the uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And the slide there is simply of a map from his thesis in which he looked at changes in population density in St. Louis using both population data and satellite imagery. Thanks very much, Wes. Thanks, Patty. Thanks for that nice overview of, of Northwest Missouri State's programs. Um, I'd like to turn now to our second panelist, um, Stephen Hick from uh, the University of Denver in the Department of Geography. And uh, Stephen's been at the University of Denver for quite a while, I think since 1994, if my notes are correct, and he's been a lecturer and now serves as the GIS director. He's also got a, a lot of uh, connections in the community, including GIS Colorado, GIS in the Rockies. Um, and prior to uh, being at the University of Denver, he worked in consulting, including um, UGC consulting and, and IT and services. So welcome, Steve, and I'd like to hear about the University of Denver's programs. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be here. And uh, just a little bit about the University of Denver. We were founded in 1864 as a private institution situated at the base of the Rocky Mountains in an area that people interested in geosciences refer to as Geotech Alley. There's a lot of GIS activity that occurs up and down the front range of Colorado. The university has about 10,000 students, and of that, about 60% of those are graduate students. So we have a strong emphasis on graduate education here. We've been teaching GIS at the university since 1983, but it was in 1994 that we launched one of the nation's first GIS certificate programs. We followed that up four years later with one of the first Master of Science degrees in Geographic Information Science. And about 10 years ago, we put the certificate program online. And about three years ago, we put the master's degree online. So we're sort of new to that realm, I suppose. I'm pleased to talk about our faculty. In the geography department, we have 14 full-time faculty members that have the traditional interests in physical and human geography, as well as a third of us focusing on geographic information science. We also have another 14 adjunct faculty members that teach in our GIS certificate and master's degree programs as well. And I believe that uh, we offer a cutting edge education and training for students. And while theoretical work is important, we certainly have a stronger emphasis in applied GIS education. Sometimes it's a little confusing how to get started in our program because we offer our certificate and our master's degree through two different divisions or colleges at the University of Denver. University College is our continuing education arm of the university, and students apply to University College to begin work on their Certificate of Advanced Study in Geographic Information Systems. It's a 24 credit hour program, so we are on the quarter system, so students will take six four credit hour classes, and you can complete that in three quarters to a year and a half, uh, six quarters, depending on how fast you want to take classes. And the cost for that is around $12,000. The master's degree uh, is offered through the Department of Geography, so a student applies again to matriculate into the uh, geography department. And the master's degree is a 48 credit hour program, but students that have completed the certificate are halfway done. So we certainly urge or encourage our students to start in the certificate program, earn their first 24 credit hours, and then move on to the master's degree. So the whole thing combined is about a $24,000 ticket item. I spoke earlier of how online learning works, and I always like to talk a little bit about the logistics. Uh, certainly the necessity of a broadband connection is critical in understanding how you're connected, how you're online. And we certainly expect people to be fairly computer literate uh, when they take their or sign up for their first GIS classes. Um, Students need to have administrative privileges on their computer so they can install software and download and uh, large data sets. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a VMware environment. So uh, students, for all the other applications, and we have lots of different software applications available, for students to access some of those, uh, they log in through this virtual environment. And the desktop that you experience online is the same desktop that you would see if you were sitting right here in the lab. 
and you can go on to the next. Okay, and we have uh, a lot of different GIS courses to pick from in our certificate program. There are about 22 classes to choose from. And then when you move on to the master's degree, there are nine additional courses to choose from. Uh, in the certificate program, we have classes you, that, classes that you might expect, like things in classes in remote sensing and GPS and internet mapping, and also specialty classes like GIS and business and crime mapping and analysis. At the master's degree level, you're studying project management, database design, advanced statistics, and research methods, and all of that culminates in a capstone project or a thesis, as, as Patty had mentioned. And then often I get asked about transferring credit hours from other institutions because there's probably a pretty good chance you've earned a certificate someplace else or you've started graduate work elsewhere. And you can transfer up to 10 quarter hours from another institution, although the final word is in our graduate school. After you've finished all those courses, where do you go from here? And I like to focus on Shannon, who's a GIS specialist down in Gunnison County, Colorado. And Shannon had a part-time job and started in our certificate program, and that morphed into a full-time job. And Shannon's a mother and a dog owner and an avid outdoors person, and uh, her capstone project was particularly interesting in that she worked with neighboring Hinsdale County, a very rural county in south-central Colorado, and helped them establish and implement their first E911 system, which you'd think in this day and age everybody would have, but not necessarily so. Brian Brill went through our GIS certificate and master's degree programs, and I tell people he has the job we all moved here for. He gets to live in the mountains, and he gets paid to ski. He completed his certificate and master's degree and became an expert in forensic animation and uses that to recreate ski accidents all over the country. He uses GPS to map the scene, and he turns that data into 3D images and video to present in court where he's a certified expert witness. So anyway, thank you for your time, and uh, I look forward to continuing our conversation later. Thanks, Steve. I'd, I'd like to, uh, in a little more depth, also introduce our third panelist. Uh, as I mentioned, he's also my boss, and he's sitting across the hall from me right now, Dr. Anthony Robinson, uh, who is lead faculty for online GIS programs here at Penn State. Um, Dr. Robinson has uh, teaches and advises students in the MGIS program, coordinates faculty and staff, handles student affairs. Um, also serves as the assistant director for the GeoVista Center in the Department of Geography, and his research focuses on the science of interface and interaction design for geovisualization and geovisual um, analytics tools. And so without further ado, Anthony? Thanks a lot, Wes. It's a great opportunity to provide an overview of our program and to see what the other folks are doing as well. So Penn State's online programs began in 1999, and since then we've served uh, over 4,000 students across our country and other countries around the world. The Department of Geography at Penn State offers these programs as part of a long tradition of geography scholarship. Our department has highly regarded faculty who have helped shape much of the technologies and methodologies that all of us are now familiar with in the GIS world. Our online programs include department professors who are focused on the cutting edge of geospatial information science as well as senior professionals who are some of the best and brightest in our professional world. We're motivated by a pretty simple mission. We want to support aspiring as well as experienced GIS professionals who are looking for a superior quality geospatial education. To support that goal, we offer a variety of GIS certificate and degree programs, and I'll go over some of the details here. We offer a post-baccalaureate certificate in GIS for both aspiring and experienced GIS professionals who have a bachelor's degree already. This program requires 11 credits to complete, and most students take about a year to finish it. The certificate program is designed to provide the fundamentals of geospatial knowledge and applications and does not assume prior GIS experience. However, for folks with a substantial GIS background, we offer a professional track that substitutes advanced selective topics in place of core courses. And generally speaking, we work with each student individually to develop a customized plan of study in that case. Our Master of GIS degree requires 35 credit hours to complete and usually takes about three years. The certificate program makes up the first year of the MGIS program by default. Students in our MGIS program complete the degree with a capstone research project that culminates with a presentation at a professional and academic meeting. Uh, sometimes it also includes a publication. We also offer two similar programs focused on geospatial intelligence, a graduate certificate and an option that is part of Penn State's Master of Professional Studies in Homeland Security. For students who are interested in geospatial intelligence in general, those classes can be included in our regular certificate at MJS programs as well, so it's pretty flexible. 
Finally, I want to mention that for professionals who simply seek one or more special topics courses, we are able to offer enrollment in non-degree status for almost all of our current classes. So our classes themselves cover a pretty wide range of topics relevant to the geospatial professional, and we're constantly working on adding new classes and revising our existing offerings to reflect the latest and greatest uh, things that are happening in GIS. I've included some of our course, current course topics here on this slide. This is just some of the stuff we offer. Uh, in addition to all of the core GIS classes that you'd expect for a basic GIS curriculum, so I'm not listing um, sort of the fundamentals here, just the stuff that might be interesting to those of you who are already familiar with the field. We're quite excited about new courses we're beginning to offer uh, this year, like Location Intelligence for Business, which Wes teaches, and a new class on Cloud and Server GIS that will launch in the winter. Students in our programs take classes over four 10-week semesters each year in fall, winter, spring, and summer terms. And most students take a single class at a time. That's how we've designed it. Tuition at Penn State costs $716 per credit hour currently, and the cost of our certificate program comes in uh, just under $8,000 while our MJS degree comes to about $25,000 total. Most of our courses are also available for review as open educational resources, which means we post the content for free. And you can find those classes at the link you see there. We offer a little over 20 right now. So the details about how our courses uh, operate and all the little logistic things we talked about so far are a lot less important than what really motivates us to do this stuff, and that's our students. Uh, Lindy Worsham here is a great example of a Penn State certificate student who's directly benefited from our program and she's used it to advance her career. Lindy works uh, for a no nonprofit organization that, that focuses on displaced persons along the Thailand-Burma border. She actually took her classes with us from Thailand and was able to apply what she learned immediately to her job. Like many of our students, uh, Lindy comes from a background outside of geography. Her background is in political science. She found herself in a position where she needed GIS theory and skills to advance her career, and she was able to satisfy those needs through Penn State. At the master's degree level, Chris Garanson provides another example of the type of exceptional student we're really focused on attracting and educating in our programs. Chris came to the MJS program as the director of the GIS Center at the New York Department of Public Health and Hygiene, so he already had a really good job. Chris worked with his advisor, Dr. Frank Hardesty, to develop a capstone project on GIS and public health that ended up paving the way for a National Science Foundation fellowship to support his research, and ultimately led to a publication in an important journal. Since he's graduated, Chris has now advanced his career again to become the director of the Parsons Institute for Information Mapping at the New School in New York City, which is amazing. If you're interested in contacting alumni from our programs like Chris and Lindy, you should let us know through the contact information at the end of this presentation. Uh, I'm happy to be able to point you toward a new map mashup we've made that connects our alumni to prospective students. So you can use this mashup to find people who are geographically local to you and contact them directly to talk about their experiences with Penn State. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Anthony, and, and thanks actually to all three of you um, for giving us a nice overview of, of your programs. And um, I'd like to turn again to kind of this notion of uh, FAQs, uh, calling this one just the facts about our programs. Um, Steve already alluded to uh, some of the folks that teach in the program at the programs at DU, um, but I'd like to turn to Anthony. Anthony, who teaches in the Penn State program? So uh, it's not a simple answer because it's a lot of different kinds of people. Um, we have both resident uh, tenure line faculty who teach in our programs, as well as uh, a wide number, wide range of professionals that we've hired on a fixed term basis uh, to work in our department, and in some cases to work part time at a distance to teach for us. And those folks include the best and brightest people we can find in a particular area. So as one example, um, we've hired Karen Shuckman, who used to be the past president of ASPRS, uh, to develop and teach our LIDAR course. So we try to find the very best people, uh, no matter where they are, and have them teach for us. Thanks, Anthony. Same question, Patty. Okay, at Northwest, all of our courses are taught by uh, full-time faculty here at Northwest that have a uh, terminal degree, PhD, with an emphasis in uh, GIS or, or GI science. Thanks, Wes. Okay. Uh, next question, and... Uh, I, I think that this one's a pretty common one, especially for the, the newer folks that we sometimes have on the webinars. Um, can students without a GIS background be admitted to these programs? And Steve, I'd like to turn to you first. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, absolutely. Students uh, don't have to bring a GIS background to the program. Uh, that's why we have introductory courses in geographic information systems and in remote sensing. And I think that's part of the excitement about the, the program is that you have people with varied backgrounds and they bring their own expertise to the online class environment. Okay, thanks. 
Anthony, you mentioned Lindy as an example of a certificate student. Maybe you could characterize the backgrounds a little further of the average certificate and master's student at Penn State. Sure. So we have two different kinds of certificate students usually. We have uh, people who are already in the field of GIS in some way and they need to formalize and extend their education. And then we have folks who are completely new to it. So we support both options through different tracks. Um, the master's program is a little different for us. Uh, we're really focused on senior professionals there, not necessarily senior, not to be old, uh, but we're focused on professionals there who have substantial GIS background. So it's not uh, something where someone who is new to GIS can uh, immediately become enrolled in our uh, master's degree program. However, if you do are new, finish the certificate, and do very well, uh, it's quite possible for you to be admitted to the master's. Okay, thanks. Patty, same question to you. Can students without a GIS background be admitted to these programs? Thanks, Wes. Yes, they can. Uh, we have the prerequisite course that allows students with no background in GIS to acquire the, the knowledge that they need to, to move into the other course. So yes, for both the master's degree program and the certificate program, students can be admitted without a GIS background. Okay, thanks. Uh, turning to our next question, this is certainly a pretty common one. Do I need to take the GRE, the dreaded uh, graduate record exam, to apply? And Patty, I know that uh, the GRE is required at Northwest Missouri State. Anthony, what's Penn State's policy on the GRE? You don't need to take the GRE if you are uh, interested in taking the certificate program. If you are wanting to be admitted into the master's program, you do need to take the GRE unless you have five years of professional experience in the GIS world. Okay. Steve, same question. Well, like at Penn State, uh, for the certificate program, you do not need the GRE. For the master's degree, uh, we know most working adults uh, don't really want to go back and take the, the GRE, but we will waive that if you've completed half of your certificate hours with a grade point average of a 3.5 or better. Okay, thanks. Um, another common question, and, and, and folks have addressed this a little bit in their presentations, but we'll come back to it now. Uh, will I be able to transfer credits into your programs? Patty, how does that work at Northwest Missouri State in terms of transferring credits? The student um, provides uh, uh, official transcript and syllabi of the, the courses that we would like to transfer. The syllabi allow us to make a comparison between their courses and ours to see what the best uh, transfer would be. We allow either nine or twelve uh, semester hours to transfer depending upon the um, the university that a student is from. Um, and the, cor this, the courses have to have been taken for graduate credit. Thanks. As opposed Anthony. to continuing education credit. Okay. Th thanks. And Anthony, same question to you. Very similar to how it works at Northwest Missouri. Uh, the only thing I would add really is that in our master's degree program we could uh, accept up to 10 credits of high quality graduate work uh, taken not for a degree somewhere else and uh, up to three credits uh, for the certificate program. Okay, thanks. I, I, the final question for this particular FAQ is I think one that's at the front and center for a lot of folks right now and that is uh, what is the job placement for students in these programs? And Steve, I'll turn to you at DU first. Okay. Well, many people have probably heard that the U.S. Department of Labor has identified geospatial technology as one of the three fastest growing job industries in the nation. And uh, certainly there are many opportunities for people with a GI science background. Like most universities, we have a career center that provide uh, basic job placement uh, help. We also in our department have a faculty member who's devoted to orchestrating internships for our students. And that really leads to, uh, well, internships are a wonderful opportunity to get out there. And I can't overemphasize how important it is to network in this industry. So while getting a good education is important, what you know is important, who you know is critically important. So it is valuable to get to know your faculty. That's where your networking begins. And get to know your fellow students, because that's where you'll hear about the opportunities. Okay, thanks, Steve. Anthony, same question. I think it's a nice follow-on. Sure. Uh, so one thing we're really focusing on here, in addition to the sort of standard things that um, uh, Steve just mentioned, we have very similar kinds of uh, resources here at Penn State to help with career counseling. One thing we're really focused on in, in our, uh, our world is connecting our alumni uh, to current and prospective students. So the matchup I mentioned earlier in my talk is one way of doing that. It's been very successful so far. People can contact people near them 
go meet and talk about the job market right now, maybe uh, make a connection there, a personal connection that leads to a job or an internship. And um, we're also able to satisfy student requests. We had one a couple weeks ago. Uh, someone was applying to SAIC and wanted to know um, if we had any alumni who uh, recently graduated who were working at SAIC. And we were able to put them in touch with, I think, a dozen different people. So we've been trying to maximize um, networking opportunities through our alumni network as much as possible, too. Thanks very much. Um, well, hopefully we've answered some of the general questions that tend to come up. And uh, one, one thing I would like to point out is just that an hour isn't a lot of time to go into some of the technicalities that we've covered. So if anything, hopefully by t the end of today, we'll have got you thinking about the kinds of questions you can be asking in terms of getting prepared for your graduate career and then contacting uh, these individual programs and folks at these programs um, directly to get more specific answers. But we actually have uh, some questions we'd like to ask you before we move into the open Q&A at the end of the talk today. And uh, we're always particularly interested in finding out what our students and, and future students um, are most interested in studying in terms of preparing them for what they see as opportunities out there. So we have two polls back to back, and we're going to ask you simply, what course topics would be valuable for your continuing education? And, and this can be something you're doing in your job now or something you think you might like to do. But click all that apply. So Nora, if you'll go ahead and turn on poll number three for me. Yeah, you bet. And uh, the five choices we've got on the first half, remember we're going to do this in two parts. So you'll have ten choices to click all that apply. The first half, web and mobile GIS, geospatial programming, including open source, spatial data-based development, spatial analysis, and remote sensing and image analysis. So go ahead and just take a minute and let us know which of those topics interest you. And by the looks of it, with 65% in, all of the topics are very interesting. And considering that those are courses that I think we're all thinking about, we're headed in the right direction. Uh, we'll give you just a couple more seconds to vote. OK, Nora, why don't we go ahead and uh, close that poll now and show everybody the results. And uh, looks like web and mobile GIS at 78%, spatial analysis 75%, 63% uh, with spatial database development, geospatial programming 60%, and remote sensing 46%. So interesting results. And we'll all be taking that back to our faculty groups and certainly considering the information you're providing. Let's turn to the second poll now. And that is um, the same question. But, uh, and Nora, if you'll go ahead and open poll number four, I'll just read those choices. Uh, we'd like to know if you're interested in geospatial intelligence, public health and epidemiology, business GIS, commercial applications, energy and the environment, or is there something that we haven't chosen here? So you can go ahead and click other. And we'll give you a few more minutes to choose. About 60% of you are in. And we'll wait till we hit about the 85% mark. So go ahead and take another second. OK, looks like we're leveling off there. So why don't we go ahead and close the poll. And uh, from this grouping of five, it looks like energy and the environment at 64%. 54% uh, for geospatial intelligence, 43% other. 39% business, and 20% to 26% uh, public health and epidemiology. So thanks very much for contributing your opinions. Uh, we, we certainly value that. Um, I would like to turn to, and Nora, if you can give the slide deck back, a quick slide uh, with some additional resources. And we've even got a note here. Don't worry. Uh, you don't have to jot these down. There will be a follow-up note. We'll probably get that out on Friday, if not uh, a day or two after. Um, but there are some websites you can uh, contact these individual programs at. And again, we'll have more um, specific information as well as email contact for you in the follow-up letter. And, and like I said before, this is a lot to cover in an hour. So hopefully you're dipping your toe in the water just a little bit, thinking about your options, thinking about what questions to ask, and then going on to the programs that catch your attention and, and asking more specific questions. But we always like to leave time at the end for questions. And so it is now time to turn to our Q&A panel. And Nora and I have been looking uh, carefully at the questions that you've been fielding uh, or that you've been sending us uh, to make some selections here. 
And I think the first one that I want to pose to the panel, which is a good place to start, someone mentioned that um, either they already have a BS in GIS or just finished a BS in GIS. Uh, is it worth their time to get a certificate or a master's when I already know the basics? Um, Anthony, why don't you take that one if you like? Sure, that's a good question. I would say the um, that that particular background matches about I would guess seventy five percent of the students in our programs here at Penn State. Um, the The opportunities provided from a certificate and master's degree uh, are are quite different in that you have, have the ability to specialize um, in areas of interest that are really contemporary and relevant. Um, so if it's programming in Python, uh, learning LIDAR, um, we have a new class on location intelligence for business that Wes is doing, um, seminars on mashups, things like that where uh, having some credibility in, in emerging topics is really important. That's sort of where you can distinguish yourself uh, beyond that bachelor's degree. So I would argue it's a good opportunity for that. In the master's program, people are typically looking for something there uh, to focus on with a capstone that really helps them pivot in their career and maybe switch to a different area of interest, let's say from, uh, from facilities management type stuff to emergency management. Thanks. Uh, Patty, would you like to comment on that at all? I would just like to say that some of our students have found that the fact of having graduated education, uh, in particular a master's degree, allows them to move up in their, uh, at their particular employer or to move to another employer where the master's degree is another credential that is, is valued by the employer and actually can result in, in an additional uh, salary increase. Okay. Steve, same question. Have anything you'd like to add or have they covered it? I think it's pretty much covered, and I, I think the students that have finished their undergrad degree uh, may not have had the opportunity to do the work that they want to do. So uh, the opportunity to do a master's degree uh, presents the opportunity to do a thesis or a capstone where you're self-directed and you can specialize then in something you may not have had time to do as an undergrad. All great points. Thanks, panel. Um, we have a number of questions here about uh, financing education, and, and of course that's pretty typical when we bring up a topic like uh, how, it, how much education can cost to some folks. Um, I'm going to run through uh, about three of these briefly, and uh, I'll let um, just whoever wants to grab it first, maybe uh, Steve, you, if you want to grab this first one. Um, one person asks, uh, oftentimes in a resident program there are graduate assistantships like teaching assistantships or research assistantships that uh, help defray the cost. Uh, is that available to an online student at DU at all? No, it's not. Uh, our teaching assistantships and research assistantships are for our resident students because they're helping out in the classroom. Um, our tuition is, uh, we offer a scholarship that makes the tuition the rate that it is. Uh, to make it comparable to other schools in the country. So that's not an option right now. Okay. And, and Anthony, I'm just going to speak for us. I know that we generally don't have that kind of option at Penn State either. Um, Patty, anything you'd like to say on behalf of Northwest Missouri State? It is not a, an option for us either because, as, as Steve mentioned, any uh, uh, assistantships are working here at the university and need to be uh, here locally. And, and I think that's pretty standard. I think if we had other programs represented today, if we could get more folks on the call, we'd, we'd find a similar answer. I think that's pretty atypical for um, online students. Um, but perhaps on a more positive note, one student asks about the post-9-11 GI Bill. Um, Anthony, I know Todd deals with this a lot more than maybe we do on the GIS side of the house, but do you have any comments you'd like to make with regard to how our students are benefiting from the uh, post-9-11 GI Bill? Sure. Uh, I'm not the expert on financial issues by any means, but I know that a, a large proportion of our students um, who are coming from a military background are taking advantage of that particular option. And we have um, a world campus, Penn State World Campus representative who focuses just on uh, military students and can work with uh, you directly on, on how to finance your education that way. So we can put you in touch with people like that. Okay. Anything uh, you'd like to add, Steve or Patty, with that regard? No, I would just put people in touch with our financial aid office. Yeah, and, and I think that's pretty typical. Uh, as, as I mentioned a couple times earlier in the call,
call. Uh, none of us are really financial aid experts, so the best thing to do is get in touch with the program so that they can put you in touch with the individuals. And, and you know, in Penn State, for instance, there is, uh, in certain circumstances, availability to set up some assistance, but it requires um, working through those folks in some special circumstances. So you want you really want to check in on your, your individual situation. And um, I'll just uh, kind of uh, cut off a couple more questions so we can move on to something a little meatier. Um, a couple folks have asked why some schools have in-state versus out-of-state where others don't. I'll just ask you to direct that to the individual institution directly so that they can answer that. Um, we'll have follow-up email and, and web addresses in that follow-up letter. Um, I, I think one thing that we could all talk about here, one person asks, what version of ArcGIS do these schools use? Is it 9.3.1? Is it 10? And maybe more important, how soon after the release of a new um, version of the software are schools implementing the technology into their coursework? I'll turn to Anthony first on that one. I know he'll have something to say there. Sure. Uh, we're using 10 right now, and it usually takes us, it depends on the instructor, to be perfectly honest, and it also depends on students. Um, it usually takes us about four to six months to transition our core courses over to the right, uh, to the newest version. We get mixed feedback on doing that. I'll be totally honest with you. Um, a lot of students would like to go to the newest version immediately, and a lot of students are working with one, an older version every day and haven't moved ahead. So we're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place sometimes on that. Um, education institutions with the ESRI site license uh, receive uh, access to new software way, way ahead of its public availability, so we do uh, wrap our heads around it pretty early on in the process, but it's definitely an ongoing thing, um, an issue that we, we grapple with, and your feedback on what we should do with best practices should be uh, would be great. Steve, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention two things. One, I, I talked earlier about our virtual environment, and what we do is provide two virtual desktop environments. One, you log in and ArcGIS version 9.3.1 is available, or you select the other one and you can run version 10. It's, it's tough for us because when a new version comes out, we have many students lined up and expecting us to be at the bleeding edge of technology and to have software installed immediately. And we do it as fast as we can, but people have to understand we also have we have our own IT people that we have to work with and we have to wait for a, a natural break. We don't do anything midterm and usually there's a, at least a quarter lead time before we can make an upgrade. So we tend to do most of our upgrades in August and December because those are our biggest windows of opportunity. Great. Um, we have a lot of questions and only about three minutes to go. So I'm, I'm kind of scrolling through and, and trying to consider the ones that might be of the most benefit. And I think one that might be terribly interesting to a lot of folks, um, what sort of help resources do you provide for the capstone project or thesis? Um, you may want to watch the earlier Going the Distance webinar. That was specific to Penn State's program only, but we actually went directly into how does someone do graduate level thesis research online. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and let Steve and Patty each respond to that quickly because I'd like to get one more question in if I can. So Steve, what kind of support do they get in their thesis work from a distance? Uh, there are two ways. One, we have a capstone seminar where the students are sort of going through the process together and then we provide advisement that way. Or students work one-on-one -on -one individually with a capstone advisor. So they, we mutually agree on a, a partnership between a student and a faculty member and then they have all the guidance they need. Patty, same question. A uh, student will have a thesis advisor, a faculty member that works directly with them. They will also have two other faculty members who serve on their thesis committee. And so any of those three faculty members can provide uh, whatever support is, is needed by the student. Thanks. And, and if you tune into that Going the Distance webinar, folks, um, to see the Penn State version, you'll find that we also have a faculty advisor and then a, a whole sequence of processes that help the students kind of move towards that culminating project and then presenting it at a professional conference. Uh, I think there's a, a really nice question to end on, and that is uh, someone asks, if I'm ready to get going with this for fall of 2012, what should I do next? Anthony. 
Uh, well, you can go to our uh, World Campus website that we just posted a link to a second ago that you'll see later on, and there are online applications to get started for both of our programs. And I would actually say, uh, why wait till fall 2012? Because we operate on four semesters a year, so you could actually start this winter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Steve, same question. <laughs> it's, it's a little late to get started in the master's degree program, but one can jump into the certificate program almost at any time, and we start classes again on January 3rd. Same question, Patty. I would direct students to our, our web page where there's a link on how to apply where they can get to the online application and see the other application materials that are required. And we are still in the window when we could admit students for um, spring 2012, which starts the second week of January. Okay, thanks. Um, before I thank our, our presenters uh, one last time and, and hand back over to Nora, um, although we don't always do this after our webinars, we've had a lot of good questions, and I think that um, our faculty that represent the various programs will all be eager to help me answer some of your questions in a follow-up email. And what I'll commit to you to do is we'll get the follow-up email with the URLs out almost immediately, and then if Nora can make it happen, we'll send a second follow-up maybe in about a week to 10 days with some of your specific questions answered because there were a lot of great questions out there. One person uh, typed in about accessibility for people who are deaf or may have other um, hindrances to normal uh, computer operations. And, and I think those are great questions. We want to answer those. So we will come back to those in a more specific format. Um, I'd like to thank the three of you. It was a great talk today. Dr. Anthony Robinson from Penn State, Steve Hicks from the University of Denver, Patty Drews from Northwest Missouri State. And I'll hand back over to Nora. Thanks, Wes. Yeah, and I'd like to thank the four of you, plus our entire audience, for coming today. Um, and as a reminder, we are going to get a copy of the webinar out archived and out to you as soon as possible. I will also include a link um, to the previous webinar on this topic. And please join us next uh, um, for our next Directions Magazine webinar next Thursday on the retail analytics in an enterprise cloud with Oracle Spatial and Oracle Sub Site Hub. And um, we really do appreciate you joining us today. Thanks again, and be sure to tell a friend about Directions Magazine. Bye for now. Bye, all.